Open your Bibles to Mark 10. I want to deal with some questions tonight surrounding the topic of marriage and divorce and remarriage. Let's read Mark chapter 10 and in verse 11. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. Mark deals with both the man and the woman. What would happen if a man put away his wife and remarried somebody else? And what would happen if a woman put away her husband and remarried somebody else? No exception is given in Mark. In Matthew's account, we encounter the next piece of the information. In Matthew's account, we're giving one exception. Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality, that is sexual immorality, that is that she has cheated on him, and marries another woman commits adultery. Matthew adds, there is one exception to what Mark says. You can put away your mate if they've been sexually unfaithful to you. You can put them away, and you can remarry somebody else, and it's not adultery. Then in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew goes deeper and records Jesus saying something additional. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the cause of unchastity or sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. That is when she remarries somebody else, when she marries again. Because the next phrase says, and whoever marries a divorced woman like that woman commits adultery. Matthew adds something else now. Matthew says, not only is there this exception clause, but if you put away your mate, not for the cause of sexual immorality, you are probably going to cause them to stumble. And whoever marries them is now caught up in adultery. So Matthew takes it a step further. In fact, if you look at those four verses, all the bases are covered. That is, we deal with what if a man does it? Okay. What if a woman does it? All right, those bases are covered. Then, what's the only exception? That base is covered. Then, what about the woman who is put away? What about the put away woman? Well, if she marries again, she's an adulterer. What about the individual that marries that put away woman? Well, he is an adulterer now. That covers all the bases. All the bases of that question are covered in those verses as far as the people involved, excuse me, people involved. Now, in our culture, you look at these passages and you say, whoa, this is not where most people live. I know all sorts of people who have divorced, especially around Thanksgiving and Christmas, you're somewhat reminded of that at family get-togethers. You show up at family get-togethers and hear relatives, and they've been through this marriage and that marriage and et cetera, and you talk to their kids, what are you doing? Well, we're going here or we're going there or we're going in between or whatever. And you're going like, well, I know a number of people I work with or neighbors or friends or relatives that, according to these passages, are in adultery. That is... They got married, they got divorced, and nobody cheated on anybody. They just got divorced. No one was unfaithful, and they married somebody else. According to these passages, that means they're in adultery. That means they're in sin. That means the only way that they can make that right is they got to stop that relationship. they got to get out of that marriage. Uh, Mark, it's too hard to tell them. It's too hard to tell somebody. you got to get out of the marriage you're in. Well, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to tell somebody that. Here's one of the objections I've ran into on these verses. It's too hard to tell people who are already married, who are already in a marriage that violates these passages, to tell them that they can't be married to one another any longer if they're going to be right with God. I've had to do that a number of times, tell people that. And they didn't know that. No one had told them. And someone had to tell them. That's too hard. Yeah, it's hard. It's really, really hard. But this is hard too. It's really hard to tell somebody they're lost. 
That's hard. It's hard to tell somebody they're lost when they don't know it. It is really hard to tell somebody who is very religious that they're lost when they think they've been saved for a long time. You had to do that? Kind of inform somebody or give some scriptures to somebody that, you know, you think you've been saved, but you've never been saved. You've never been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You told me that. Well, you can't be saved. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. You can't be saved right now. Even though you have felt like you've been saved for a long time. How about this one? Basic Rights Oregon has been... You probably got stuff from them. I mean, they have these neat little flyers with homosexual couples. Some of them, they've been together for 40 years. They probably love one another. It, hard to tell somebody who's been together for 40 years, you don't have a right to be together. That's hard. That's not an easy thing to do. Okay? So there are ha other hard things that you have to do in life. But you know what? The question of Mark, that's a hard thing to do, that's already been answered. We've already been told the answer to that question. That is not something that we even speculate about. The Bible already gives you a definitive answer on that. Godly people tell other people the truth. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 3 and in verse 18, I'm reminded of this passage. Just, this is one of those passages that just kind of can, it sticks in the back of your mind there. It reminds you, you know, I can't opt out. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked way, that he may live, that wicked mind shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I require at your hand. Now, that wicked man may not appreciate your warning. And that wicked man may not say, thank you for the information, I'm going to ch change my ways right now. That wicked man may blow you off. That wicked man may say, none of your business, what's your problem? Uh, you're trying to run somebody else's life. You know, uh, you are self-righteous. That wicked man may say all sorts of things. But notice that word may. The reason you own the wicked is that he may. You're giving him a chance to live. Now, he may not view it that way. He may not like the information you give him, but you're giving him a chance to live. You're giving him grace. You're giving him mercy. You're giving him a chance to correct things before it's too late. You've got to view it that way. Here's another way you have to do it. When you, if there's any a time that you have to tell somebody, and they're in a marriage, and it violates Matthew or Mark, and you, and you have to say, you know, here's some passages, read these passages, you do not have a right to be married to one another. You know who you need to think about? First of all, you need to think about God and Jesus. Okay? Think about God and Jesus, because they want that person warned. They want that person to have a chance to repent. But there's something else. You need to think about the person they left years ago. You see, when you see a couple that is together, but they both walked out of marriages unscripturally years ago. You know who, who's easily forgotten? The husband and wife that was left. Don't forget them. Don't forget those people. Those people might be still alive. You need to realize that somebody out there is saying, amen, amen, Mark, tell them, tell them, Mark. Family members may be saying, well, finally somebody tell them that wasn't right what they did years ago. Well, finally someone... Make them see that and own up to it and deal with it. There's been a lot of people in the world that have just been given a free pass on this topic, a free pass. They left, they, they split up, whatever, they were just given a free pass, and God says, stop giving them a free pass. Someone needs to say, like in the next example here, and the one that follows, you don't have a right to your brother's wife. John the Baptist says, a lot of people gave Herod a free pass on Herodias. I'm not going to give Herod a free pass on Herodias. A lot of people look like ignored it, and I'm not going to ignore it. We're going to talk about it. But in the book of Ezra chapter 9, this is, that's not the only place there. Ezra chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, you have a definite Old Testament biblical precedent on this issue. You have two examples of God's own people 
forming marriages that violated Scripture on some point. It was a violation of Scripture. In Ezra and Nehemiah's case, it was people that had married women, verse 1, the people of Israel, the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands. According to their abominations, those of the Canaanites, Hittites, you know the rest of the list, that is, they had formed marriages that violated Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. You can't marry those people. They had married those people. Ezra's told they've not separated themselves from that. That was the expectation. That's the only way those situations could be made right, is they had to be ended. I like what is said in Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 23. Nehemiah, in those days I also saw that the Jews had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. I saw it. I saw it. And you know what Nehemiah did with that? He spoke up about it. We need to deal with this issue. We need to talk about this issue. John the Baptist did the same thing. But let's talk about John a little bit in Herod's case. One argument that I've heard is that Herod's case was a situation of that Herod had been guilty of marrying a close relative, and that's what the problem was. That it was not about marrying somebody that didn't have a right to be married. It was about marrying a close relative. Well, let's take, and it was, it's not adultery, so we can't, the argument is we can't use Herod as a precedence on this topic because Herod was, Herod was not, a, his case was not a case of adultery. All right. Now, if the text had said that Herod had married like his sister, then you can make a case that Herod's sin was simply marrying a close relative. It's a, okay? But the text doesn't say that. The text says he had married his brother's wife. Yeah, that's a close relative, but it's also somebody's wife. It just happens to be his brother's wife. That's adultery as well. He had married a woman who already in God's sight had a husband. Now, before we move on there a little bit and make an application, let me go back to Matthew chapter 19, all right, and just kind of notice something there. The reason, the reason that the new marriage is adultery, the reason, you divorce your mate, they were not unfaithful to you, you marry somebody else, you're in adultery. The reason that God calls it adultery is because God has not recognized that divorce. And that's Matthew chapter 19. Jesus was asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause at all? Verse 3. He said, have you not read that he who created them male and female, or created them from the beginning, made them male and female? For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Consequently, they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, no man separate. That's why it's adultery, is that God joined them together. And even if you get a divorce, if there's been no adultery, God doesn't recognize it. You're still married to that person you married. That's why it's adultery. You're still married. Yeah, you got a divorce. God says, I don't recognize that. I join you together. And you cannot just unjoin what I join. You just cannot act like I didn't join you. You cannot ignore what I did and just walk away from that. That's why it's adultery. All right? That's why it's called that. Now, back to Herod's case. Herod's guilty of both sins. Yeah, he marries a... A, a close relative or his brother's wife, but also he marries somebody that already has a husband. Now, if you say Herod's guilty of marrying a close relative, you haven't solved the problem. If Herod is accountable to God when it comes to marrying close relatives, all right, if he's accountable to God when it comes to marrying a relative too close, if you're saying that's what the sin is, you got a big problem because that's going to automatically bring you back to being accountable on the sin of adultery 
as well because Leviticus 18, 16, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. That is, you should not be sexually involved with her, which would mean you don't marry her, all right? Well, but in verse 20, the same context, the same chapter, you shall not have intercourse with your neighbor's wife. That's adultery. If you can be guilty of the sin of incest, then you equally can be guilty of the sin of adultery in God's sight because the same chapter condemns both sins equally. Both sins violate God's marriage law. So if you, if you can commit the sin of marrying a close relative, if you can commit that sin, you know you're accountable to God's marriage law, and you know you can commit the sin of adultery as well because they're under the same umbrella. And anyone can commit those sins because God here says, first of all, don't you do that to Israel. But secondly, he says in verse 26, um, but as for you, you're to keep my statutes... Excuse me, verse 24. Do not defile yourselves by any of these things, for by all these the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. That is, all the non Jewish nations in the land were guilty of these sins. Now, Leviticus 18, right there, makes it clear that all men, no matter what race you're from, you're accountable to God's marriage law. You're accountable to the same rules. There's not, one set so, there's not one set of rules sexually for Christians and one for non-Christians. In Leviticus 18, Canaanites and Israelites both were accountable to the same standard. Let's go a little farther here. But what about adultery? Here's what some people have said to me. They've said, well... It's a one-time act. Matthew 19, 9. Marries another and commits adultery. It's a one-time act. It's not an ongoing sin. It is, it is a sin you commit when you put away your mate, not for fornication, and marry somebody else. At that moment, you commit that sin, but you can stay in the new marriage. It's a one-time act. Well, is it a one-time act or is it an ongoing sin? Is it something that you say, hey, God, I'm sorry I did that, but I can keep my new wife? Or is it the only way I can be right with God is i got to get rid of the new wife? That's the only way I can get right with God. I'm going to make the case it's ongoing. All right? And here's my, here's my proof. Number one, when does adultery end in all other cases? When does adultery end in all other cases? It's when the relationship ends. If a man is cheating on his wife, the adultery will end when he gives up the affair, right? You can't say, I repent of that affair, but I'm still seeing her. <laughs> no, he ever repented. I mean, the only time adultery ends in all other cases, you know, a man's married and he has a woman on the side. The adultery ends when he stops seeing that woman. That's when the adultery ends. It's not the first time he hooked up with her. It was a sin, and not a sin every time after. It's a sin every time he's with her. Right? I mean, that's, I think we've got that one figured out. When does any sin end? When does the sin of drunkenness end? When you stop drinking. When's the sin of lying in? When you stop lying. When's the sin of cheating in? When you stop cheating it. Sin ends when it stopped. Honey, I repented of that affair I was having, but I'm still having a relationship with that woman. No, that's not repentance. We would not call that repentance. We repented of living together, but we're still living together. That's not repentance either. In all other situations, a, a homosexual couple has to stop being a couple to be right with God. A fornicating couple has to stop being a couple, has to stop sleeping together to be right with God. 
A man who's having an affair has to stop having an affair to be right with God, right? I mean, some guy comes and says, I want to be baptized, but I'm cheating on my wife. you got to stop cheating on your wife. I'm not going to baptize you while you're cheating on your wife. There's no repentance there. Equally, you got a man or woman in violation. They're in a marriage, but that marriage was formed in violation of Matthew 5 or Matthew 19 or Mark 10. They've got to cease that relationship to be right with God. That's, that's true of all sin. That's true of adultery in all cases. You know what? I think this question has already been answered. That is, is it ongoing or a one-time act? Jesus did not leave us in the dark about the adultery in Matthew 19. One time, is it a one-moment sin? Or is it a continual sin as long as the relationship lasts? Which one is it, Jesus? He already told us. Matthew 19, 9. Whoever puts away his wife, except for the cause of fornication or sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery, and it's in the present tense. Now, you can try to argue that the present tense doesn't mean the present tense, but I think you just, I mean, if we're going to do that, then we might as well not even pay attention to what the words in Scripture say. There has to be something, there has to be something really strong to tell you that the present tense does not happen to mean the present tense. All right, that's the first thing. Here's my second argument. Matthew 19 is not dealing with a one-night stand. It is not dealing with a one-time sin. And marries another. That's a relationship. Not hooks up once with somebody else. Marries. That's an ongoing thing. That's an ongoing relationship. And marries another woman. That's ongoing. Mark 6, verse 18. It is not lawful for you to have, to have your brother's wife. That's ongoing. Not it wasn't lawful for you to form a union with her initially. No, it's not lawful for you to have her now. That's ongoing. If, a, if, if the adultery of Matthew 19 was a one-time act, then John the Baptist is wrong. Because it was lawful for Herod to have her. He could continue to have her as long as he said he was sorry for getting her in the first place. But John says it's not lawful to have her. If you can't have her, you can't have her. Like right now, you can't have her. That is, if you can't have her, you have to get rid of her. What's the only way Herod can make that lawful? you got to stop having her. I don't think that's a difficult... And Herod knew that. And, Herod, and Herodias knew that. I mean, obviously Herodias is not going to form this plot to have John the Baptist's head removed if their marriage can be made right. Herodias understood what that meant. He's saying we can't be together. That sin was not just a one-time act in the past. The sin was still ongoing. Herod's present relationship with the woman was not lawful. Romans 7, verse 3. So then one of her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she should be called an adulteress. I think that passage bears out the ongoing nature of the sin as well. She shall be called. How long will she be called that? Here's, what, here, here's something to think about. If the sin of adultery is a one-time act, it was simply committed when you divorced and remarried, and never happens again after that. If you did that 10 years ago and said, I'm sorry, but you kept the woman, you're not called an adulteress. You're not called something that you did once 10 years ago and have never done it since. You're not called that and said you were sorry. You're not called that. This passage says that this woman, her husband is still alive. She is joined to another man. She's with somebody else now. 
And in that relationship, what is she called? And that's an ongoing thing. She's an adulteress. She's an adulteress. She's an adulteress as long as she's joined to that other man. She's an adulteress. All right. Sometimes people say, well, you can't, you can't commit adultery with the person you're married to. Well, there are about four passages that say you can. Matthew chapter 5, verse 32. Is, and just, it just comes out and, and says that. Matthew 19 says the same thing. But Matthew 5, 32, just to reiterate that, and whoever marries a divorced woman, there's a marriage. You married someone put away. You married someone that does not have a right to remarry. Commits adultery. Okay. There's a number of passages that all have married people being involved in adultery. All marriages are not lawful. Herod's marriage was not lawful, for he had married her. That's what the text says. He had married her. They'd gone through a ceremony. On this topic, some people, this, but Mark, this is too complicated. This topic is too complicated. My problem with that is that Jesus was asked the question directly, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any cause at all? He was asked, he wasn't asked, Jesus, will you comment upon marriage in general? Or will you comment upon divorce in general? No, he was not asked that question. He was asked a very limited, very narrow question. Is it lawful to divorce for any cause? That's the question he was answered. Now, if the Bible text is too confusing, then he did a really bad job of answering that question. He directly answered it. Answered it directly. And I don't want to accuse him of being a bad teacher. I, I got a book in my library on divorce or marriage, and I think the, the authors say that, it, you know, it's like, but the biblical texts are like ambiguous or confusing. Look at Matthew 19.9. Is that any more, is it any more clear than Mark 16.16? 16? Huh? I mean, you got one cause. What's the cause? They have to cheat on you. What happens if I put them away and they haven't cheated on me and I marry somebody else? Adultery. Uh, that, 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 I mean, that's unfair to accuse Jesus of being like covert or ambiguous or unclear in the passage. So let's lay down some ground rules that we have. Or only adultery on the part of your spouse gives you the right to put them away, divorce, and remarry. That's the only cause. You can't, you can't divorce if you're just tired of being with them. You can't divorce if they don't take a bath, you know, frequent enough or whatever. You, you just, you can't divorce if they become usual and typical to you now. You can't divorce them if you see somebody more attractive or you think is. There is no scripture that allows the person put away. We read all these passages on the person put away. There's no scripture I know of that allows the put away person to remarry. I mean, I've got passages that allow a single person to marry. I've got passages that allow the person who was cheated on to remarry. I've got passages that allow the widow or widow word to remarry. But I don't know a passage that allows the put away cheater to marry. I know no passage on that. Marriages that do not follow this pattern bring people into sin. They bring innocent people into sin, like the man in Matthew 5, 32. That woman who is put away unjustly or put away for adultery, and some man, he may be a man who's never married before, okay, but that man marries that woman, he, not her, she does too, but he commits adultery. He's never been married before in his life. He has the right to marry, but he marries somebody that does not. He is in adultery. Innocent people can be brought into sin if we're not clear on this. And I think as I started with, every base is covered. Well, what about a man who's married? We dealt with that. What about a woman? When can a woman put away her husband? Dealt with that. What about the woman who is put away? What about the put away woman? What about her? What about the person who marries a put away woman? 
What happens to the man who puts away his wife? Not for scripture cause, and he remarries. Are not all the bases covered? All the people in the scenario are dealt with? I know some people say, Mark, this is really, really complicated, and so let's just God sort this out at the judgment. When do we ever do that with any other sin? Must I live my life with a question mark over my soul? No one should have to live their life with a question mark over their soul. I think I'm going to heaven, or maybe we'll just let God sort this out. What if situations? I know sometimes people, well, what about this, what about this, what about this? First of all, God already knew all the what ifs. Before G Jesus gave Matthew 99 or Matthew 532, Remember what we talked about this morning, divine deliberation? Shall I, shall I tell Abraham what I'm going to do? God reasons everything out, right? I mean, it, before the foundation of the world, it was determined Jesus was a good God. God already thought all of that out. Before Jesus gave Matthew 19.9 or Matthew 5.32, God had eternity to sort through all of this. To look at all of the scenarios far more than we even know about to look at all the different scenarios, to look at all the different what-ifs, and here's what he came down with. The only cause is they cheat on you. That's the only cause you can put them away. That's it. That's the rule he gave. Which means that rule trumps all what-if situations and all what people might call really, really hard cases. What-ifs never alter Scripture. Bad behavior should not be rewarded. If, you, if someone gets themselves in such a tangled mess, we should not reward them with altering Scripture for them. Yet that's exactly what's done when people try to alter a passage for what they consider a real hard situation. But it's already been answered. The what if, what people might call hard situations, are already answered in Scripture. In Ezra 10, verse 3, marriages that had been formed, that even had children out of the marriages, had to be ended. Because when they were formed, they violated Scripture. That's a hard situation. But that's the rule. God said, I've already answered that. I've already given you the precedent for that. As we close, this passage. In Matthew chapter 19, the disciples immediately understood what Jesus said. In verse 10, the disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. That's a poor point of view, but they understood what he said. They understood that what Jesus was teaching was different from what their culture taught. It is that no, you cannot put away your mate for this, 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 and this reason. You married them. You had to make it work unless they cheated on you. And probably they thought the chances of a woman cheated on them would be very small. So if they married a woman, they pro that probably meant that they would be married to her for their entire lives. They understood exactly what Jesus was saying there. You know, it's interesting. I don't think I've ever run into a new Christian or a non-Christian that did not understand Matthew 19, verse 9, the first time they read it as far as what it was saying to them. Because everyone I've ever run into that read it for the first time and took it seriously did not say, now I have a question, but did not say, they came back with, whoa! What? They immediately understood what the passage was saying to them. They immediately understand that that passage nailed everything down into one exception. And if you divorced your wife and that was not the exception you have and married somebody else, you were in sin. They immediately understood that. Disciples understood that as well. And then in verse 10, 11, not all men can accept this statement. That, that does not mean that you don't have to obey this verse if you don't want to. Verse 10, verse 11 doesn't go back to verse 9. It goes back to verse 10. Jesus is not saying, well, not everyone has to follow verse 9. No. He is saying what the disciple said, it's better not to marry. He's saying not all men can accept that conclusion of living single. 
Not all men are going to live single. Okay? Then he says this verse. Okay? There are eunuchs who were born that way. There are men that don't marry because of a birth defect. All right. There are eunuchs who, made them, who were made eunuchs by men. There are some individuals that unfortunately somebody else made them a eunuch. And so they don't have the option to marry now. All right? So they remain single. But there's a last category. They're individuals who will make themselves eunuchs, not physically make themselves a eunuch. But there are individuals that will not marry in order to make it to heaven. Because they understand they don't have a right to marry. There are individuals that wherever their past is, whatever their past may be, but maybe they did divorce their mate, not for fornication. Or they were put away. Maybe when they were a non-Christian, they cheated on their mate, and they were put away. And they understand that the only way they can make it to heaven is that they've got to make it to heaven being single. There's that category of people as well. Now, that statement makes no sense if you never lose your right to remarry. That statement makes no sense if you let, never lose your right to remarry. You would never have to make yourself a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven. When would I have to make myself a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven? Well, when I have to forego marriage in order to get there, when I don't have a right to be married or married again, when no verse justifies the situation I'm in, when no verse gives me the right to be involved in this marriage or in another marriage or a future marriage, when I can't find a verse that justifies me, when I can't find a verse that gives me the right to marry again. The purity of the Lord's church and eternal life is far more important than my personal comfort here. And I'm impressed that Jesus just said that. No apologies for that. Just said that's the way it is. That's the way it is. Heaven is that important. Heaven is that important. All right. Well, I appreciate your attention tonight. Those are some questions I want to deal with, it, with primarily because those are some questions that recently I encountered and just wanted to deal with that. And I think we always have a new generation. I always want the young kids saying, oh, okay. I think it's an important topic as you go out. Who has the right to marry? Who doesn't have the right to marry? That we're clear on that. We may have to deal with this topic. Just make sure that you live in a way that you don't have to deal with it in your own personal life because you're going to have to deal with it enough in the lives of people that surround you. When you look at those passages, you could say if you're here and you're not a member of the Lord's church and you're not a Christian tonight, you'd be like, whoa, whoa, I didn't know the Bible said that. Yeah. That would really be a sacrifice for some people, yes. It would be. But that's not the only people that have to make sacrifices. Anyone who's been a Christian has had to make sacrifices in order to enter the kingdom of God. So we might feel sorry for somebody like this, but there's a lot of other people in other situations that have had to give up quite a bit to either become a Christian or to remain faithful. There are people that have lost their family, the love of their physical family, when they obeyed the gospel. You know people like that? Where their mom and dad cut them off. I'm not having anything to do with you. You became a Christian. They've had to make sacrifices. There are people in other countries that have had to lay down their life and in other eras that have had to lay down their life to remain faithful.
to remain <laughs> to some people remaining faithful meant that they lost the relationship with their children. A lot of people have then to make some very big sacrifices. And so I know those passages we talked about, that's a sacrifice. Yes, but it's nothing compared to what Jesus did for me on the cross. If you want to talk about a sacrifice, let's keep sacrifice in perspective. He was nailed to a cross for our sins. And none of us have ever been required to make a sacrifice like that. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Why don't you come and stand as we sing the invitation song? <laughs>